Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Mark Feeney. Uh, I'm, uh, my day job is an arts writer at the Boston Globe. I write about mostly photography and film, but other things too. Uh, but I've also done all kinds. I've been at the Globe over 40 years, so I've been an editor. I've been um, a reviewer. I've written about politics. I've written about culture, books. Uh, I also lecture in American Studies at Brandeis University. Uh, and in 2004, I published a book called Nixon at the Movies, a book about belief with the University of Chicago Press. And I believe that's what got Robbie interested in talking to me. <laughs> uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you got even – I mean, what did you learn about Nixon in the movies? Um, I'm very interested in Hollywood and – I guess, much like yourself, politics seems to be involved in everything. Uh, I've started to notice on all these topics. So I actually now have an interest a little bit in politics. I kind of like to stay out of the two party system type of mentality, but I just want to learn about more about the 60s and 70s because I found Understood. a little bit less tension there than today's right. uh, modern day situation. Sure. Absolutely. Um, well, if you uh, were around in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, you would have been an interested in politics and, and culture. There are a number of stories, news stories involving Nixon in Hollywood. Um, the best known is that shortly before he ordered the invasion of Cambodia, he had screened uh, Patton, the biopic starring George C. Scott, for which Scott won a well-deserved Oscar. Not only did he screen it once, but then he screened it two additional times. He loved Patton. Many people say that Patton was his favorite movie. It was not. He liked his favorite movie. He liked it very much, but his favorite movie was something else, which we can talk about later if you like. Another two other stories, much uh, smaller stories, but again, they got a lot of attention. Um, he uh, had Love Story, the Ryan O'Neill, um, Ally McGraw uh, romance, big hit screened uh, at the White House. And he said he liked it, but he complained about the blue language, which in light of what later came out with the White House transcripts and expletive deleted is pretty funny. And then one other news story was that uh, he was asked to comment on the Charles Manson trial, which was then going on, I believe this was in 1970. Uh, and he said, very strange, because Nixon, of course, was a lawyer and knew he shouldn't say such a thing that uh, you know, he thought Manson was guilty, and he had just seen a John Wayne movie called Chisholm, in which that kind of frontier justice was what should be used against Charles Manson. Um, now, in, in moral or emotional terms, one can certainly understand that, but if the president of the United States, you don't go around saying stuff like that. Uh, and then I would just add as a footnote, he was, a, not surprisingly perhaps, he was an enormous John Wayne fan. Do you is there some similarities with some of the movies that he watched, like a strong figure, not really an outlaw type, but a type of guy that doesn't deal with any BS kind of? Sure. Well, an important thing to bear in mind is that over the course of his five and a half years in the White House, it's kind of shocking to realize so much went on that it was only five and a half years. He had at the White House, at Camp David, at San Clemente, uh, Key Biscayne, he had screened more than 500 movies. So it's, there are certain genres he really liked, certain stars he really liked, as all of us who are moviegoers have particular genres and stars we like. But I don't think you can say that um, with so many movies watched that, um, there were certain character types, you know, strong and silent or what, what have you, that appealed to him. I mean, he was one of the only presidents, I think, to ever meet Elvis. I think Elvis was trying to be an FBI agent at the time when he met uh, Nixon in the White House. Uh, that is, it wasn't an FBI agent. Um, Elvis, uh, as you may know, collected police badges. Who knows why? <laughs> For fun. <laughs> For fun. Who knows why he enjoyed it? But anyway, so uh, he was at, I believe Elvis was named one of the 10 most 
distinguished young Americans by the, the Junior Chamber of Commerce, the JCs. And at this, and I might have this detail wrong, you may have been somewhere else, but I believe there he met the head of what was then known as the Bureau of Narcotics. Now it's the DEA, Narcotics and Drugs. And he said to him, I'd love to have a BND badge. And the director trying to put him off said, oh, I couldn't do that. How can I get one? Oh, you'd have, you'd have to ask the president of the United States. Elvis took him at his word. Elvis, a few days later, jumped on a plane with a friend, flew from L.A. to D.C. Uh, I forget. I guess he went first to the the D doesn't matter, but I don't know. He went straight. Maybe it's the red eye. He went straight to the White House from the airport, or he went to the hotel first. But he went to the White House and handed to the security guard a note written on American Airlines stationery saying, "Dear Mr. President, I'm Elvis Presley. I can assist. I can be a big help in battling drugs, but I need a uh, badge to do it. Can you help me? I am staying at whatever hotel." So this note gets handed up the chain of command to uh, the president's appointment secretary, Dwight Chapin, who's one of the few White House uh, insiders who's still alive. And in fact, just last year, I believe, published his memoirs. And Dwight Chapin, uh, who's a youngish guy, sent it along to H.R. Haldeman, a name I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Nixon's White House chief of staff. Uh, as it turns out, a much more interesting guy to give him credit for, and certainly the man who really created the template for how a White House chief of staff operates. Very, very efficient guy. And Haldeman <laughs> scrawls on the top of the memo, you must be joking. Uh, and Chapin says, no, no, it's a good idea. And so they call up Elvis and say, sure, come on over. The president's free for 15 minutes from 1245 to one o'clock. So Elvis comes over and there are uh, a set of photographs that were taken, as, as you and your listeners probably know, uh, every president has a photographic office that records in great depth uh, his, or ultimately, someday, her doings. Um, and so the White House photographer uh, comes into the Oval Office and there are a set of photographs, I think eight, of Nixon and Elvis meeting. Uh, and one of them, the most famous one, the two of them shaking hands and looking into the camera, uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but for many years was the most popular item uh, from the National Archives, because you can order the photograph, the postcards of it. The Nixon Library has, has all kinds of uh, memorabilia with the image on it, you know, mugs and t-shirts and so forth. Um, and so Elvis says to Nixon, Mr. President, I, you know, we really like to get this badge. And so Nixon says to whoever, yes, we can do that. See this taken care of. And so a few days later, Elvis, who of course is a drug addict, gets his badge for the Bureau of Narcotics and Drugs. Did you, with even his obsession with film, did he just have some type of cultural obsession? It seemed like he was I, very aware I, of it. I'm careful with the word obsession, but the cultural is important here. Richard Nixon was born in 1917, uh, which means he came, 1913, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, Kennedy was 1917, which means that he was a young man before television, but when the move, but during the sound era, the movies came along and that, you know, it's hard for people to imagine today when we have the web and so it's streaming and all these things available to us. But basically, if you wanted visual entertainment, you had two choices. You could go to vaudeville, which was dying, state shows, or the movies. So he became, as was quite common among people of his generation, he became a regular moviegoer. He'd go to the movies frequently, but was a big fan. And that just that habit stayed with him. Then when he's in the White so imagine yourself, uh, it's 1969. There are not readily available, I mean, VHS machines exist, but they're, you know, the size of refrigerators and very expensive. If you want to see a movie, you have two choices. You go to a movie theater 
or you watch the light show or whatever on TV. He's in this job where not only is there literally a movie theater in his house, the White House, and there are also projection options uh, at Camp David, and the uh, Navy, which is handling his communications, will happily set up a projector at his country, his vacation homes in San Clemente and Key Biscayne. But the Motion Picture Association of America, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C., you're talking a little about politics and Hollywood. Not only do they let him request any movie he wants, but they're eager to provide him with any movie he wants because it's a way to curry favor with the president of the United States. So you're a movie fan and you can watch anything you want from, you know, all the way back to the silent era up to the most current releases. He watched The Godfather 12 days after it opened when, you know, lines, it's becoming the most popular movie, it's become the most popular box office hit for several years. You know, you had to wait in line to see The Godfather. He just has somebody pick up the phone and after dinner, personal screening of The Godfather. So it's not an obsession is too strong, I think. Um, but he was an enormous, he was a big fan which in some ways is even more interesting because it's something that lets us, who are ourselves moviegoers, it gives us a way to relate to him as another human being. I mean, part of what makes Nixon so interesting, I think, is that he seems so artificial and unreal. He was so, unlike almost any successful politician, he was so, just, he was always uncomfortable in public. You couldn't, and, and it just seems so stiff, so unnatural. But here is this aspect of his, this little publicized aspect of his life that is something I think we can all relate to. You know, you've had a long day at the office. You eat your dinner. Let's, let's go to a movie. The difference is he just has to walk a few steps, and he doesn't have to make it by the runtime. He decides when the runtime is. And he just has to sit back and watch a movie. He can be in a way in which he could not otherwise be. He's always on display. He has to be aware of how he's presenting himself. And he's a smart enough man to know that he's not presenting himself well. He's not John F. Kennedy, who's naturally star-like and has this uh, manner in public that people love. But once the lights go down, once he's sitting in the dark, Two things happen. One, he can enjoy what's there in front of him on the screen. And two, no one's there to, to watch him. He can just be himself. That's a very long answer to your question. No, it's a great answer. It's just I, I start to when you say that, I start to think about like the way that history views Nixon, most people would think it would be a, a terrible thing for a president to watch films, but I would treat it as an escape. You know, I mean, we all have stress in our everyday lives when we find one thing, whether it's painting or whether it's listening to music or doing something just to get away from it all. Imagine being the president of the United States and having to deal with all the problems at the same time, still try and find some time for yourself as well, too. Well, and also two other things. One, uh, it wasn't just movies. I mean, Nixon was a very serious reader, uh, not just uh, nonfiction, but also fiction. Uh, he loved classical music. Uh, apparently, when he was young, he was a very good pianist, and there was some talk of him, you know, maybe trying to become a professional musician. So he, he, even though you use the word obsession, he was obsessed with politics. I mean, not even just his own career, but it, 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 everybody, whether they're Nixon supporters or Nixon haters, but everybody who dealt with him would agree that nobody was as insightful and knowledgeable about politics as Richard Nixon. Because that was just, he got it. But he did have these other interests. And on the issue of its being a good, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for a president to interested in the movies, uh, would you care to guess which press, so a, a theater was put in the White House during the Franklin Roosevelt presidency. So there's been one since the mid 40s. Would you care to guess which president, so Nixon watched more than 500 movies. I think it's like 524, something like that. And if he had been in office for an additional uh, two and a half years, who knows, maybe he would have hit, uh, hit a thousand. But anyway, 
uh, but he is not the president who watched the most movies. And I'll give you a clue. The president who did was a one-term president. So it, this is a president who liked movies even more than Richard Nixon did. You say Kennedy. It's not Kennedy, is it? No, it's not Kennedy. Said... Kennedy was famous for I – mean, he'd go watch a White House movie, but he would often walk out. He had a very short attention span. Interesting contrast with Nixon. Uh, not Kennedy, but good guess. Ooh. Is it a more modern day one or is it still back there in the past? Well, it, 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 well it, it's in the past. I'm trying to think. I don't know. I couldn't guess it. Jimmy Carter. Really? Yes. Though I think there's an additional factor involved. You may recall that he, had, he and Rosalind had a young daughter. Mm -hmm. Amy Carter. And uh, what parent, I mean, you know, it's the classic thing. If, if you have a, a, a young child, what do you do? You watch a video, right? You put slip a disc in, a Disney movie, a cartoon, whatever. So I'm sure that a large portion of the movies he watched, Jimmy Carter watched, were family oriented. And he watched it with his wife and daughter. But that not at all. Uh, and the one other, we're not here to talk about Jimmy Carter, but the one fact I'd like to point out that might amuse you is that the first movie Carter had screened when he was president was a movie called All the President's Men. No shit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know that. Yeah, I know. I, I That's guess Carl Bernstein's, isn't it? Carl Bernstein. Well, that's the one about Woodward and Bernstein. And it's where Dustin Hoffman is Bernstein and Robert Redford is uh, Woodward. Have you ever seen it? I haven't seen it. It's a re I mean, with your interest, you've got to watch it. Hey, in and of itself, nothing about politics. It's a really good movie. But if you're interested in Nixon, put it on your Netflix queue or whatever. You, you've got to watch it. I'm trying to understand him more. I'm trying to do that with every president. I think it started with Kennedy, and I've been deep into his assassination, trying to speak with many people like Bob Blakey from the HSCA has been on here and trying to really understand it. And it just drifted me towards Lyndon Johnson. It drifted me towards Nixon. And I, I don't, like I said, I told you off air, I don't think anybody's necessarily 100% bad. And Nixon's history, everyone remembers like the Watergate stuff and like the greatest, like, and I, you kind of have to dive into him a little bit more to realize he's a lot more than just that i think he there's definitely some things he had like a different like he's trying to start his own fbi because j edgar hoover couldn't get on board but also it's like how are i think everyone at some point thinks that when you become president these people work for you and that's i think nixon found out pretty quick that it's not how it kind of went to me it just kind of shed light like if you look at like someone being targeted there's a lot of weight to support that about nixon i mean nixon i've listened to his debates i've listened to everything he was saying and i told you this question off air if nixon would have beat kennedy there would be none of this history everything he was saying i could feel the audience in the debates between him and kennedy where the audience was like yeah 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 and then it's just like we we only know that now because i think the vietnam war and a bunch of stuff had just shifted the culture in such a way that his mindset was still for the 60s. It was for where that generation and everything before that and every single presidency was already going. Yes. I mean, there's this sort of horrible irony in Richard Nixon becoming president and you know, being sworn in at the beginning of 1969. You know, the 60s are sort of coming to, to a climax and he is like antimatter to the 60s matter. Um, and it just, he was, I mean, it, forget ideology, but in terms of intelligence, in terms of, uh, experience, in terms of, uh, discipline, he was in many ways really suited to be president. So he was the right man in the right place at the completely wrong time. Have you ever tried to figure out or think about what it was like to be sitting in a theater watching a film? And much like when we all watch films, our whole everything thoughts go away. We just are paying attention to being in the moment and watching this film and realizing when it's over and the lights go back up and you got to go, I got to be the president of the United States again. Oh, my God. I couldn't imagine that. That just gives me goosebumps even thinking about it. Right. Right. 
Well, I think with, with Nixon, though, it was a tricky thing about being president. I mean, I think part of him loved being president because it was the ultimate validation for this poor kid from, you know, uh, who's the son of a, of a bankrupt father uh, from Yorba Linda, California. But also the aspects of it, the public aspects, we talked about this slightly earlier, that you see, like Reagan loved being in the spotlight. I think Ronald Reagan loved being president. That part of it, Nixon sort of shrank from, and he just, it was like he, he had to do it so he could have the title, but it was the title that mattered more to him than what, well, th th there were two things that mattered to him. One was the title, and two, he saw himself with justification, ultimately, as this master of diplomacy. And he didn't really care about domestic politics. He, he said as much. It's there on the tapes. If he could have spent every waking hour dealing with foreign policy, he would have been, you know, the happiest guy in the world. Um, so to get back to your point, I think when the lights came back up, there was part of him that was eager to get back to being president. But there's also part of him that was thinking, oh, I wish this were a double feature. Do you know why he ran Cambodia a couple more times? Um, or not Cambodia, Patton, when he did the whole Cambodia situation? Well, I think on? It, 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 one can only – well, the, 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 the couple of subsequent times he said – he sort of made it a, a command performance for a number of aides, and he thought it would buck them up. It would, it would boost them. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the film, but it's this very worshipful view of uh, – General Patton, as they say, magnificently portrayed by George C. Scott. Um, and it's from a time when, um, you know, America was winning. Winning, in fact, against a far mightier foe than, than North Vietnam. Um, though, that said, there's one other aspect to the movie that I don't know if you're familiar with Gary Wills, the political columnist who wrote what remains, I think, the single shrewdest study of Richard Nixon. It's called Nixon Agonistes, Nixon Against Himself. And in it, uh, Wills points out that the person who most bedevils the character of George Patton is Dwight Eisenhower. Because Eisenhower is, you know, the commander in chief and he's kind of keeping Patton on a short leash and of course, for eight years, Nixon was Eisenhower's vice president, and Eisenhower treated him terribly, terribly. And so I, I suspect Gary Wills is right, and one element in Nixon's pleasure, and you know, when you love a movie, you're perfectly happy to see it again, see it multiple times, is that uh, it's, it's watching Ike be sort of get, get, getting, it, getting back at Ike and having Ike be kind of a villain. Do you think but, that? I'm sorry. I just one other point. I, I, you get me started. You're in trouble. But as an example, though, of how complicated Nick, this this previous thing we talked about Nixon's complexity and dividedness. So there were ways in which, with every justification in the world, he deeply resented Eisenhower. I mean, there's the famous. It's 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 true. This happened uh, shortly before uh, the the election. In 1960, there was a press conference, and a reporter said to Nick, to Eisenhower as it was ending, "Mr. President, can you name one thing that the Vice President has done that or achievement or blah blah blah?" And Eisenhower, who easily could have, you know, somehow kissed off the question, and said, "Well, give me a few weeks, and I'll think of something." I mean, God, talk about shooting the poor guy in the foot. That said. Uh, Nixon, as anybody who's ever watched him knows, is very uh, obsessed with uh, being unemotional and being in control of his feelings and so forth. But one of the very few times he is recorded 
as having wept in front of someone else was Eisenhower been in the hospital for a long time, he was dying. And Haldeman, I mentioned earlier, H.R. Haldeman, the chief of staff, was given word that Eisenhower had done it. So he tells Nixon in the Oval Office, and Nixon just turns his back on him and starts to weep. So this is an example of the weird twistiness and complexity of Nixon's feelings towards others, how, you know, he could be resent so resentful of Eisenhower, but also clearly loved him. He was a complicated guy. I, I think his complexity definitely answers some things for me. There's a lot of stuff that I know about Nixon with like conspiracy related stuff, obviously, but more about just hearing it for myself, like the Bohemian Grove mentioned on a Nixon tape. You know, things of that sort. I just think he wasn't a part of that. He didn't like that fraternity lifestyle. That whole thing when the White House and through every presidency seems like kind of like a major frat group in a way where it was like everyone's Meaning thinking the with same. other presidents. So I'm not quite sure. I follow. More like everyone's the same mentality of things, which is like we're doing this, whether it's the intelligence agencies off on its own because of plausible deniability or things of this sort. But then Nixon comes in and Nixon's like, I want the FBI to do this and the CIA to do this or whatever. And then they're just not having it because they're already invested into their own stuff. And I have to think of like, I mean, he was a like Johnson had the Johnson treatment was very muscly, kind of knew everybody in the political system. Nixon had similar things to him. But at the same time, I mean, he made like, quote, like the Bay of Pigs thing. He made a quote about the Bay of Pigs or something like that. I just feel like he was holding a lot in and everyone's kind of not really giving him the light of day on some things as well, too. Like they're all off doing their own little programs or whatever. And Nixon comes in like, can you do this for me? And they say no. He was like, well, I'm the president. You got to kind of do it. He's not getting any respect. And you, you mentioned the thing with Eisenhower, his vice presidency. He's not getting respect then either. At this point, taking going to be president, it's not only fulfilling a goal for yourself to get some validation, but it's also like I'm going to start commanding some respect here. I want people to see me in a sense. So I'm not sure if that's a, a question or what. It was a question. Yeah. Okay. I was talking about the fraternity <laughs> I... system of – the the whole thing with the whole po political things like well, i said he is I mean, targeted through history there th 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 certainly there is an institutional aspect to government and nixon always saw himself not a little justification as an outsider and he I mean, the best example of this is uh, with Kissinger. You know, rather than, as I mentioned earlier, and as anybody knows much of Nixon is aware, he was obsessed with foreign policy. So he's got a Department of State, you know, 10,000 people, ambassadors, and, you know, counselors and so forth to do his bidding. Nixon didn't want to do that. He wanted to sort of have his own in-house operation which took the form of the National Security Council, which pre-existed Nixon, but he used it in a way no other president had before. Um, leave out the State Department and just do it his way. He and Nixon was almost like this, you know, two-man team trying to run the world. Um, I think it was a combination of impatience with institutions uh, and also... And this might be a little too much of a stretch, I don't know, but he was so uncomfortable with other people that the smaller the group he worked with, the happier he was. Um, I mean, at his heart of hearts, I think he was kind of uh, a gorilla, G-U-E-R-R-I-L-A, -R -R not you know, the other kind of gorilla. Um, Rather than, I mean, Eisenhower was literally a five-star general at the head of a giant army. Nixon saw himself more as kind of a, a guerrilla fighter who sort of was, would get results acting on his own. Did he develop relationships with anybody besides his close personal aid? Like, did he have any connections or any confidants that he could talk to about a lot of certain well, situations? Well, his, his, he had two close friends. Uh, Bebe Rebozo, who's a real estate developer in uh, Miami, and a guy named Robert Abplanalp, who uh, became rich because he uh, invented the aerosol spray. You know, when you when you yeah, yeah. I think everybody yeah. uses that yeah. daily. <laughs> the, the valve, 
on top of an aerosol spray can, which if you think about it, that's a pretty good patent to have. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, specifically with Rebozo, uh, people would come on how they would be together like all day on a boat or on the beach and just not say a word to each other. And I think most of us, when we think of a close friend, we think of someone we can confide in, that we have a lot of back and forth with, that we converse with and talk with. But I think as with being in a movie, being with Rebozo, Nixon could just kind of be a part. Um, but beyond those two guys, he really didn't. I mean, the, the only he was very close to his daughters. I mean, sadly, wasn't I? Don't think really close to his wife. Um, I think he was a, a, a deeply lonely person, um, and radically apart from others. Which again is odd because. Politicians, almost without almost without exception, are extroverts. They're sociable. Uh, or if they're not, they make the effort to appear that way. And with Nixon, that wasn't the case. Did he ever keep diaries and things that kind of illuminate him a little bit more? I mean, I know we have the Nixon tapes, and there's just so many hours of content from those Nixon tapes as well, too, that I'm pretty sure there's probably a lot of it that's undocumented. Um, when it comes to some of the tapes that either are just unlistenable because there's some I'm listening to them. And I find those fascinating, not just the Nixon tapes, but all the presidential tapes, because one thing for me that's really important, you mentioned about being sociable as a president. I get that's like what people want. They want a good speaker. I think that's what made Kennedy pretty good. I think that's what made Barack Obama good, too, is just a good speaking formation. But I also like I don't mind if my president still does the work and does a good job and doesn't speak a whole lot. You know what I mean? Like we have this idea and this is I started learning from the tapes. When you listen to a tape of Kennedy say the F word and people go, hey, how dare you say that about Kennedy? I'm like, I'm not talking trash on the man. To me, it makes me connect more because we have these figures that seem to never have a flaw. But if you look into their past, every president had a flaw. Everyone had something going on that uh, the, it's the history books don't really talk about or something of that sort. So I think as the public, we need to kind of accept that, that these are human beings. And I think it brings us to more like a, a different standpoint, which with the Nixon, if he had a diary, he had something. You can learn a lot from those tapes about Nixon, not just things that the history books point him towards, but more like you get to understand what he was dealing with as well, too. For me, the only president I've really ever seen talk about China a lot compared to other issues that came with like Johnson and. And uh, Kennedy, not everyone was more people were focused on the communist type stuff, but he was like a little bit more about negotiating deals and talking with China about certain issues. Did you freeze on me? I'm afraid you broke up a bit. Oh, no, I was saying with Nixon listening to those tapes, they kind of revealed a lot about like even with China. For me, I've seen him deal a little bit more with China than I have with Kennedy and Johnson. So it was just interesting to see, obviously, which term and every term each president was going through, what they were dealing with. But did you find any diaries or did you learn anything more from like the tapes or anything that gave shed light into this character? Well, I think the, the tapes shed a great deal of light into his character uh, because he's unbuttoned in a way in which he isn't in public. Uh, but even there, you know, he'll often sound different depending upon who who's in the, the Oval Office, the executive office building with him. Um, I think he's always trying to impress people. And which is kind of odd since we're talking about the president of the United States. You, part of being in that job is it, you're all set, you know, do what you do, but you don't have to impress anybody. Anymore. But no, he was not. Um, he didn't keep, you know, diaries other than in a very straight, other than the way a lawyer would, you know, recording events. Um, I think he had a great capacity for introspection, but he didn't, he consciously didn't practice it because there was great darkness there and he, he didn't want to go there, which I can understand. Do you think, um, especially with Nixon, like what's probably one of the things you learned about him that might have, I wouldn't say, 
I wouldn't say steered you away from them, but kind of you were taken back by either. It could be something surprising, shocking, bad, anything of that sort. Well, hmm. I mean, I went into this research as, I'm, you know, I, I, I was... I wasn't yet old enough to vote when he's president, but I was very interested in politics. I mean, part of my interest in Nixon is that he was the president when I came political age. And so that guarantees a certain interest. But I went into it with, with very little sympathy for him. You know, I'm, I'm a liberal Democrat. And I mean, there is there is no political hate quite like Nixon directed political hate, not least of all, because everything you thought about him proved to be true. He really was a crook. He really had to resign. Da, 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 da. So in a funny way, I, I would turn the question around and say, what did I find that made him more interesting, made him more human than I had thought he was? Because um, there's lots of bad stuff in the tapes, but it's it's. I mean, I guess the worst part is how unrelenting it is. It's one thing to have a casual, uh, especially for someone of his generation, a casual racist or ethnic or uh, anti-Semitic remark or something. But they keep coming up again and again and again. And this is an educated man, a very intelligent man. He just, he just should have known better. Why did he keep it? I mean the tapes? Yeah. Oh, well, the tape, that's very, there are two, re well, the first question is, uh, there, I think uh, a, there are two questions to answer. Implicit in why did he keep it is why did he ha make them in the first place? As you know, and some of your listeners will know, uh, the first president to take himself was FDR. Not much, but some. Eisenhower did, I don't think Truman did it at all. Uh, Eisenhower did a little bit. Kennedy did a fair amount. Johnson did it a bit. And then when Nixon, when Nixon first heard, Johnson told him that, you know, I have the system set up. And one of the first things Nixon did was have it removed. Yeah, he got a new one. But then, one. as you know, he then installed it, installed a new one a year or two later. And I think he did it because Nixon was obsessed with history. Uh, of being a, f a figure of historic stature. I mean, that's why the the opening to China was such, forget just the, the policy implications, which are enormous, and we're still, you know, dealing with them, the consequences of them. But also, uh, it was so clearly a stunning event. Related to, so there would be this historical record that no other president had anything to this extent or this informative. But also, that'd be very commercially useful. Not that he would market them, but it would it would make his memoirs much more vivid, make them presumably sell better, be better reviewed than other presidential memoirs. Um, and. Um, if people disagreed with him uh, when he made his statement, he could say after he was president and he could reveal this, no, I mean, I have the evidence right here. You actually said this, it's on tape. And that's one of the reasons to get to your original question, why he kept the tapes. He told his lawyers that certain allegations he could disprove by having recourse to the tapes. But beyond that, I think if he had destroyed them, you know, several of his aides, most famously John Connolly, the former Secretary of the Treasury, said, put them on the front lawn of the White House and just make a bonfire. Just literally put a match to them, set them on fire. But I think if he had done that, that would have been in every sense except the legal sense. Well, even legally, I mean, legally, that could be seen as destroying evidence. 
But even if it wasn't taken that far, anyone who wasn't already a total Nixon supporter, you know, people had an open mind about Watergate, would take that as an admission of guilt. So he had painted himself into a corner. To destroy them would, to be would in some ways, be even more self-incriminating than to have people listen to the things that were on the tapes, which, as we now know, were uh, made him legally culpable. There's there's still a amount of tapes that we are trying our best to figure out what's said on them because either they're unlistenable or just can't understand. Yeah, the what's technical. Going on. I mean, but, but part of what's so funny about it, funny both odd and amusing, is that he's the president of the United States. He's got the whole resources of the government, but they put in a really crappy system. So as you know from having listened to some of them, it's really hard because <laughs> it's it's just the, the audio is just really bad. Do you think that he thought that maybe it would paint a different picture, not of himself, but also be able to level kind of what was going on in the political system or in behind the White House doors a little bit as well, too? Like, it just seems like, you know, Nixon gets a lot of crap as well, too. But much throughout history, we now know about a lot of people that are either in, 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 in administrations. Hoover's a good example of people that have their own baggage as well, too. And I feel like, you know, he, he's not only just giving a, a, a backdoor conversation on something for evidence. If anybody wants to give out a statement or say something about him that he could easily dismiss. But also it kind of levels the playing field out there of like what he also has to go with when he starts talking about certain issues of Hoover lining up this or doing something like that, which a lot of people might not know hoover had a great pr system there was a devil or there was a god myth created about hoover because of his influence in movie scripts and things of this sort as well too you know but then immediately afterwards there was a public kind of reaction to it which was the devil myth which was trying to expose a lot about hoover now there's a lot of people that knew what to say and knew what not to say and kind of kept their words secrets nixon was more just straightforward as a person and if you keep a lot of those tapes i feel like if you just wait for I don't know, technology to get better or whatever happens, someone's going to be able to find a lot more good about the man than what well, I guess. Well, I, I want to backtrack for a second. When you said, what do you mean when you say he was, he was straightforward? I guess more direct with what he wanted or what he meant. Maybe more direct with what he wanted, but in terms of his manner and affect, this is a very, very uptight, um, concealing, controlling person. Um, and where the tapes... Uh, over time, it proves so devastating to him is that it, this is one place where he's not appearing to be in control, where uh, he's not being evasive. He's just kind of letting it happen. I mean, it's almost like it's it, this is his id. It's not his ego. And just there are all kinds of awful statements. There are many ways the public man, at least in what he did, is more attractive. I mean, Again, this idea of Nixon keeps coming back to contradiction and complexity. You know, he's 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 conservative. Uh, uh, he's you know he becomes a national figure because of anti-communism. Yet he's the one who makes the opening to China. Uh, he's conservative, but who's the president who who, who creates the Environmental Protection Agency? It's Richard Nixon. Uh, more Southern school districts. And as we know, he was in many ways personally racist, as well as being conservative and the founder of the Southern strategy, which recalibrates American politics so that the South becomes the base of the, of the Republican Party, whereas it previously been the base of the Democratic Party. And yet, under his administration, more Southern school districts are desegregated than under Johnson, Kennedy, and Eisenhower combined. Um, well, surprisingly, Nixon had a large audience on campuses. I was surprised to find that out. It seemed like the younger generation, either if it was in the beginning or maybe more towards the middle, but he seemed like during his administration, he had a little bit of a, a reaction to campuses, not necessarily in a bad way. It seemed like some people were understanding. Well, that's about, another so example like, though, of complexity in that, you know, uh, the, the, the general understanding is that, you know, students hated Nixon. You know, it was under Nixon that Kent State happened. You know, at the, the because of the war, the the, the moratorium uh, protests in Washington, and yet in nineteen the the, the first election that eighteen that under twenty one year olds could vote was nineteen seventy two. Nixon's up against George McGovern, maybe the most liberal major party. Nominee since FDR. 
So all these young people, you know, drugs, acid, amnesty, abortion, anti-war. Nixon won a majority of 21 and under voters. It was a narrow majority, but he won it. So on the one hand, you have very high profile opposition to Nixon from young people. But many young people, more traditional, supported him. So his relationship with, with, with the youth vote, with young America, is much more complicated than, than people think in retrospect. Now, when it came closer to the ending of Nixon's administration, you know, before all the Watergate stuff, do you think? I mean, did it, would there have been anything that Nixon could have did that would have maybe restored at least a little bit of faith in people when it came to being open about something or doing something, some type of action that maybe would have kept him in there a little bit before? I mentioned before about him going against Kennedy if he would have won, but imagine if there was something that could have pulled him out of that situation. Like to me, it's always interesting when you look at the intelligence agencies, a lot of stuff, like even when Johnson had a bunch of scandals before he took office. When I look at Nixon, I was like, where's the intelligence agencies doing their job to be able to help out Nixon in a sense as well, too? I mean, there had to be something that could have been done, whether PR wise. Well, no, that gets complicated. I mean, the classic instance of that is, you know, we, we, we know what a bastard Hoover was, but part of the reason that almost to the very end, he maintained the uh, sterling public reputation he had, which you mentioned earlier, was that he knew how far he could go. Uh, and there was, Nixon wanted this thing uh, called COINTELPRO, uh, this uh, operation to use against student radicals to spy on well, it's the US Black citizens. Panther Party, KKK, other organizations. Right. Well. And, 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 and Hoover is pretty willing to, to do all kinds of dirt to the Black Panthers, but this went too far. And so he said to Nixon, no, we're not, we can't do this. So Nixon then set up things like the plumber's operation and tried to do little stuff on his own. But it wasn't like the institutions didn't want to help him out. They couldn't go past a certain point. They were spreading themselves um, too you know, thin. The, with Watergate, the, 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 the smoking gun was that Nixon is heard on tape saying to Haldeman that they want to have order the CIA to tell the FBI that it was a CIA operation so they couldn't investigate it. And the CIA said, we can't do that. But that's just so beyond the pale. And so then you get John Dean and the White House was covered up in other ways. But Nixon, who'd been, you know, in Washington for 25 years, had been Representative, senator, vice president. I mean, he, you know, knew the drill. He wanted to take things, take, and you know, he also understood very well how much uh, intelligence agencies can do, and also how fast and loose they could play. But he went, wanted to go far, so far beyond that that even J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Helms said, "We can't do that, Mr. President." I mean, this is, wasn't a case of the deep state undoing Richard Nixon. It was Richard Nixon undoing himself. Makes sense. I mean, the, the, have you ever watched the, the video of his farewell speech? Not his resignation speech, which was the night before the resignation. But the speech the following morning, his farewell speech. It's, in, it's at the White House and he's addressing White House staff. It's it's worth you know it's on YouTube of course it's worth looking up it's fascinating part of the reason it's fascinating is at the very end he says you know to those of you who are young and you're interested in politics please get involved in politics because we need you know idealistic young people and don't let all these events put you off but remember this when others hate you don't hate them back because if you hate them back. You destroy yourself. Damn. It's like he's totally, he gets it. He knows what happened, why it happened. And it's like three sentences. And it's a degree of self awareness that is just amazing. If you hate them back, you destroy yourself. And that's what he did. 
he let hate. He was hated. I can I can tell you. I mean, I was you know, 12, 13, 14, but I you know. Read Rolling Stone from back then. Read account. Don't just read that. Read the New Yorker. Read New York Times. Nixon was hated. But he's a president. Who cares what people think of me? He did. And this gets back to what you were saying at the very beginning about Nixon being there in the late 60s and the, 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 the uh, tenor of the times and how uh, that did so much to shape his presidency. He couldn't rise above it. He was personally incapable of it. Very things that brought him to the White House, the kind of drive, the ambition. Um, he couldn't turn it off. The kind of insecurity that underlay the drive and ambition, he couldn't turn off once he got to the White House. And so he did things like form the plumbers, like wiretap journalists who were writing about Cambodia, secretly bombing Cambodia. Um, Watergate, which to this day, we still don't know who ordered it, and why it happened, because it was such a stupid thing. And if he had said, the Monday after the break-in, and he goes to the podium, he was at Key Biscayne, and he says, this stupid thing happened. I don't know why it happened. It's embarrassing. It's, it's wrong. I'm firing everybody involved. He would have been fine. He would have been fine. It would have been, it would have been humiliating, and he would have lost a certain amount of support. But he's up against George McGovern. He's still going to win the president. He's still going to get reelected. But he couldn't imagine that this it was a third bait, third rate burglary, as Ron Lee, the press secretary, called it. It was, but it had all these ramifications. And once it was there, if you don't acknowledge it, you try to cover it up. It could go anywhere. The anywhere came him sending a letter to Henry Kissinger resigning. As of you know, noon on August, whatever, 1974, I resigned the presidency of the United States. I, I want to ask your thoughts on this because it's something that's kind of stumped me, and I have my own thoughts on it. But it's Nixon when he was going against Kennedy. Alan Dulles, in charge of the CIA, went with Kennedy, who was a Democrat, and Alan Dulles was a Republican. Where I always what do you mean by went with? I'm not he, sure what you mean. He supported Kennedy over and Nixon he, he, during the debates. What do you mean by supported? I mean, it, it, he said to people, I'm voting for he Kennedy. helped write some of Kennedy's speeches in his Nixon yeah. debates as well. Well, too. it is true that Kennedy kind of outflanked, you know, again, we think of John F. Kennedy as you know this great liberal icon. In some ways he was. But on like Cuba, he was much tougher in the debates than Nixon was. Uh, so there are ways in which he was, you know, as much of an anti-communist or in some ways even more than Nixon was. Uh, but I interrupted you. I'm sorry. You, you, you didn't get to Alan Dulles, a Republican, wrote the speeches, a lot of the stuff during the debates with Nixon. I guess that's where it looks like he comes off on the platform of a cold warrior because Alan Dulles knew this is how you're going to get elected if you get the people to vote for you this way. But he supported a Democrat, JFK, over Nixon, who was a Republican. Where I just asked the question, I mean, do you? Th I, my own thoughts is that Alan Dulles knew he could probably muscle Kennedy a little bit onto some things. I mean, that's where we get the Bay of Pigs, where then Alan Dulles gets fired. But Nixon didn't seem like the type to get muscled down by Alan Dulles. I think he knew that. Well, I mean, the, the Bay of Pigs uh, was initiated by the Eisenhower administration. And uh, if you look at whichever debate it is that 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 Cuba comes up and Kennedy says you know we need to be even tougher on Cuba or whatever he's basically um, sandbagging Nixon because Nixon knows about the Bay of Pigs and he can't say well in fact how can you say that because we are planning a possible invasion of Cuba he can't say that um, I don't know if Dulles felt he could muscle muscle Kennedy and, and not muscle Nixon, um, because already the wheels were turning at the Bay of Pigs. I mean, the, the, the Kennedy did. It's not just the Bay of Pigs, forward. though. Nixon had prior knowledge of what was going on in the White House because of Eisenhower, you know, his vice presidency there. So he knew what the climate was like. Kennedy was new. 
He didn't know anything was going on. And this is there's a bad reaction later with Kennedy firing Dulles, obviously, and then also relationship with Hoover trying to get Hoover to retire. But if you look at when he won the debates, those are the first two people he went to, which the only common logic there is you want to get the agencies on board. You go to their directors, the people that are, command the most respect. Hoover commanded the most respect out of all of his FBI agents, whether they're scared or whatever. So did Alan Dulles with the CIA. But then later, there's a, a complete – it looks like 100% 180, less than – I mean less than a year into his administration because of certain situations and certain things like the Bay of Pigs was an example. But there's other plenty ones out there where I go, Nixon knew what was going on way more. Like I mean it, whether Kennedy knew it or not about the, the whole situation in Cuba, I just look like he wouldn't have been able to I guess really take the crap. That Kennedy probably might have when it came to pushing him towards certain ways, like we need to do this because this is what's going on. You can kind of move a new guy into office. It's like being the new guy on the block. I mean, you don't necessarily know the whole situation of the environment. Well, I actually disagree in that um, Eisenhower, and this gets back to what we were talking about some time ago with uh, Nixon's relationship with him. Part of Nixon's resentment and bitterness towards Eisenhower was that Eisenhower really kept him at arm's length. He didn't have a White House office. Uh, his office was was uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, Nixon had very little to do with policy. It's easy to forget that prior to Walter Mondale, vice president under Jimmy Carter, the vice president had almost nothing to do with, with administration policy. And then with each successive president, the vice president has become more important. And understandably, people today think, well, of course, the vice president's a well-integrated member of the administration and an important figure, da 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 But that's, th that really didn't predate 1977. So in that sense, Nixon, while he knew about these uh, plans with Cuba, he wasn't deeply involved the way that we would think a vice president should be, and also never underestimate the personal factor. Uh, part of Kennedy's appeal was that he was a very secure person. And I think, and he'd been, a, he'd been a, 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 in Washington since 1947, when he was first elected, as a, uh, was sworn in as a representative, and then was, had been a senator, elected senator in 52. Uh, he wasn't, you know, some babe in the woods, young by national political standards, but he wasn't a babe in the woods. Um, yeah, I don't. And I think that the, the question that might strike many listeners is, well, what, in this very politicized time we're in now, why would a Democratic president have kept on uh, at the CIA and FBI Republican appointees? But that was a very different world. I mean, Hoover, in fact, had been around since Calvin Coolidge. Um, and, you know, he almost was this institutional figure. And it was seen as a form of continuity, keeping Dulles, keeping uh, Hoover. So I, 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 I don't know that I quite agree with your point. You don't think that Nixon observed anything? Even if he was disconnected from some of the policy stuff, you don't think he observed the climate of the White House at all or any of that administration? Sure, he had a sense of it. But I mean, I, like, what does climate of the White House mean? I mean, that's does climate have to mean foreign policy or does climate know who you're working with? The people beside you, the people that are involved in these institutions that go to these me meetings on a daily basis. I mean, I can get your personality within an hour. I'm pretty sure Nixon throughout the whole administration of Eisenhower can get the personality of whoever is involved around him when he's either at a meeting or he's at a press conference you're not you're looking at it more like the professional foreign policy aspect of things when i'm just saying a lot of these conflicting personalities a lot of these bolsters personalities as well too not talking about nixon but just people around him i mean you understand how these people work it's what's most important about listening to some of these tapes even johnson's tapes where he's talking about his bunghole because he wants a different pants thing it gives a different picture of the professional person you see so you just got to understand that's how people are there's a professional side and there's a private side i have to feel like if you're doing meetings i doubt all the ones that were recorded are always yes sir how are you doing today there's probably back and forth you did this i saw this and this it's blackmail as well too it's the whole issue with hale boggs and hoover talking about black or wiretapping congressmen for blackmail issues he wanted an investigation to be done by. And then the famous line, which I think is 
amazing, which is you're asking the FBI to investigate the FBI, which is just like, okay, makes perfect sense. But that's the climate there. And I think Nixon knew a lot about what that was, certain favors that could be called in. I mean, there's a quote of him, and you can look this up on YouTube, where he's giving an interview. And he goes, oh, you know, LBJ, LBJ never likes to come in second. And he does a weird laugh. But he talks about LBJ's book that came out where he's like, it's a hit piece. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, it is a hit piece. He goes, he made him look like an animal. Well, he is an animal. And he says something like that. That's a guy that knows the the climate, the the people that are there more than just the policies and everything that the public gets to see. But he knows how that environment works. Sure. Yep. Okay. Well, Mark, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show, man. Um huh? And uh, is there a place where people can find your links? Uh, the If they're interested in the book, you know, go to Amazon or University of Chicago Press website. Uh, I don't have my own website. I'm, I'm, I'm about Luddite. I'm an old guy. Um, but all I can say is uh, Jack Schaefer is the uh, is, uh, Bloomberg uh, press critic. And he famously said, Nixon is the gift that keeps on giving. And I would leave that thought. That's the thought I'd leave with, with your listeners. I mean, you, he's just so interesting on so many levels. Policy, personality, culture, the whole schmear. Endlessly interesting guy. Well, I'm going to link your links in the description and also some Amazon links for your book as well, too, and any other places I can find your book. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.